percent in favor of Alito. Though so, I heard this morning from a couple of people that the, the, the liberal Democrats may decide to push it. I hope they do, but I don't think that the votes should ever have been. I mean, but I only one Democrat has come out in favor of Alito. Yeah, Ben Nelson, right? Yeah. You think of Snow or any of them or Casey? I don't think they played that the No, do you think they vote against them? Do you think they might vote against them, or do you expect to give them cover? I think as long as there's no filibuster and there are 51 <laughs> votes, they'll let them just do what they think is best for them Politically. in terms of their state politics. And I don't know what the calculations are, but I think they'll give them that vote. Yeah. There only needs to be 50 votes, right? Yeah. Right, because Cheney breaks the tie. <laughs> yeah. We don't know what he'll do, but. But if you had all 43 of the other Democrats besides Ben Nelson, and it means you got the three Republicans tonight, Casey, mm. and Collins, there would be 40, there would be. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for coming. I feel a little uh, chagrined to be doing a Supreme Court preview in the middle of the term, but we are in the midst of a change of course as a result of a couple of new justices, so maybe this is a kind of retrospective and prospective uh, event to, to bring you up to date on what the court's been doing and what it might be doing for the rest of the year. Uh, I'm going to open with a few um, general remarks, talk about a couple of cases, and then turn the uh, microphone over to uh, Professor Chemerinsky and Professor Siegel, who have some more, uh, have selected some additional cases that are, that are before the court this term to talk about, and then we'll open it for questions. And let me at this point just apologize in advance for getting up and leaving a little early. I have a, another obligation I have to be to at 1 o'clock, so I'm going to leave here about 10 minutes of. Um, so first, let me make some very quick and general conjectures for you about the impact of uh, the new Chief Justice and, uh, by everybody's expectations, the new Associate Justice, Sam Alito. Uh, my, my my conjecture is about the chief um, is that on many important questions where the court sharply divided, uh, removing uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist and asserting Chief Justice Roberts um, isn't going to affect the divisions on the court very much. They're going to remain about the same. The Rehnquist and Roberts may differ in the style, tone, and content of their opinions. Um, and of course, this is all conjecture, but I'm... Um, come to the view that Roberts, uh, and Roberts may be a little bit more inclined to be some more expansive in his explaining his reasoning than the chief sometimes was in his more Delphic moments. But I think in terms of their general approach to the issues that sharply divide the court, there won't be much difference in the bottom line results. Uh, one way to think about changes on the court is, is, of course, to worry, speculate about how future cases might come out, but another way is to look at some past cases and see, see some obvious points in which a Roberts for Rehnquist change might have, might have made a difference. And, and I really can't, in the recent past, see many. There's one notable uh, exception to that, and that's the Hibbs decision of a couple of years ago. Uh, this was the case in which um, the constitutionality of the Family Medical Leave Act was challenged on the grounds that it exceeded Congress's power under the 14th Amendment to impose a requirement on the states that they provide 12 weeks of unpaid leave uh, for an employer, an employee to take care of a seriously ill family member. Um, somewhat surprisingly, uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist stepped outside of the line of cases that he had, where he had been joining uh, his conservative uh, brothers and sisters on the court to restrict Congress's power. And in Hibbs, they actually authored the majority decision uphold, you know, upholding, uh, in Hibbs, I should have said, upholding the constitutionality of the Family Medical Leave Act. Um, I doubt that Chief Justice Roberts uh, would have provided the same surprise that uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist did. That alone wouldn't have changed the outcome in the case because it was a 6-3 uh, decision um, with Justice O'Connor also being in the majority. Uh, so it takes the additional substitution of uh, just Associate Justice Alito for Associate Justice O'Connor uh, to think that that outcome would in fact have been different, but in fact I think it would have been had uh, those two changes been made. So there's at least one notable case in, in recent years where both the, the, the double switch is important uh, and, and might well have resulted in a different outcome. With respect to Justice um, 
Alito, um, here I think the distinctions between uh, the person he's replacing, Justice O'Connor, and, and himself are, are much sharper than those between uh, the two chief justices. Um, if I had to pick a sitting justice to compare Justice Alito to, it would be Justice Scalia. Uh, he, comes, he doesn't have as sharp a pen or as sharp a wit as demonstrated either by his Court of Appeals decisions or by his performance before the Judiciary Committee as uh, Justice Scalia. But they both come out of uh, a, a neoconservative jurisprudential tradition that uh, I think they both feel comfortable with and, um, and genuinely uh, subscribe to. So whereas Justice O'Connor was more of a conservative with tendencies to be a maverick on some issues and an even greater tendency to uh, reject doctrinal purity for a more eclectic approach, more fact intensive approach in reasoning about cases. I expect that Justices Alito and Scalia will join in more, opinion, in more opinions and hold relatively similar views on the great issues of the day. Um, so I think there w we will see some discontinuities um, between the, the uh, if, if you will, the Rehnquist O'Connor Court, which we are close to retiring, and the Roberts Alito Court, which we are uh, going to inaugurate. Uh, and with those double switches, you could actually look back and find lots of decisions where the switch would predictably, I think, have changed results. I'm not going to go through them all, but just in addition to Hibbs, I think the decision of several terms ago upholding the use of race as a factor in affirmative action programs for university admissions would have come out differently, as would the decision striking down Texas's, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, the um, Nebraska ban on um, certain late-term abortion procedures because they placed an undue burden on a woman's right to choose. But there are other areas in which the discontinuities won't be as sharp or visible, um, and in some cases the outcomes might not change at all. To give you one example of that, there's a case before the term, before the court that's going to be argued in March uh, involving the Texas redistricting decision. Uh, this case arose after a court-ordered redistricting, a court-ordered redistricting map was uh, used following the 2000 census. In the 2002 elections, Democrats held a 15 to, a 17 to 15 uh, majority in the Texas delegation despite the fact that Texas uh, was voting uh, in a deeply red manner in the present 2000 presidential elections. Um, the reason it, the result remained in slightly in favor of the Democrats was largely attributable to the incumbency factor, 28 of the 30 incumbents. There were two new seats in that election, but 28 of the 30 incumbents were voted back into office. It's, uh, it, you can actually uh, attribute the stability of Congress, a great deal of this incumbency factor as redistricting has produced more and more safe districts through the use of computers and analysis of voting patterns. And the Texas legislature, which became solidly Republican after 2002, wanted to use this machinery to secure an, a, a delegation more congenial to their sense of uh, what the distribution ought to be. And, and so they redistricted in sort of in midstream after the 2000 census, there had been one redistricting, and then in 2002, there were three, there was another. And in the 2004 elections, uh, the, the delegation shifted to 11 uh, Democrats and 21 Republicans. That, that case is being challenged as, an as constituting an impermissible partisan gerrymander. Now, two terms ago, the court decided another partisan gerrymander case out of Pennsylvania called Veith, in which four justices led by Justice Scalia, took the position that these partisan gerrymander cases were non-justiciable, essentially political questions that should be resolved by the elected branches. Four of the liberal justices on the court took um, a different view, but couldn't agree on exactly what standard ought to be applied in them. And the man in the middle, Justice Kennedy, uh, concurred in the result, which was to dismiss the case uh, but didn't go as far as holding that these cases were non-justiciable. He held out the possibility that there might still be a standard, perhaps one that was based on the First Amendment and not the Equal Protection Clause, in which the court could adjudicate some of these disputes in uh, cases that presented a clear enough set of facts. Um, and that's the Texas case is now before the court to see if that situation 
has been satisfied in Justice Kennedy's eyes. That case comes out the same way with Rehnquist and O'Connor uh, substituting back in for Alito and Roberts or, or going the other way because the swing justice here is Kennedy. I don't see any of the other eight changing their, their views about uh, the, the judici justiciability of these cases. And so it's going to be entirely up to Justice Kennedy to decide whether he's um, uh, developed a standard that he thinks is, is usable in these cases. Uh, I'll give you one more case uh, and then turn it over to uh, my colleagues in which I think the jury is out on um, whether Alito plus Roberts is going to make a difference in an important area of jurisprudence, and that's the, the Commerce Clause. Um, this is an area in which, uh, like the 14th Amendment cases, the court has been, uh, been chiseling back on the uh, limits of federal authority. And it's a, an area in which uh, Justice O'Connor has often joined the other four in, uh, in important, a couple of important decisions that have uh, restricted federal power. Uh, we've got two environmental cases that the court's going to hear on February 21. They've, I guess they've made this the day of the environment. They've scheduled both of these cases uh, uh, back to back for arguments. Both cases uh, look like they are primarily statutory interpretation cases. Um, now, many cases where the court is asked to interpret a statute can be pretty dry and uninteresting to anyone who's not a specialist. But these both involve the Clean Water Act, so at least we know they won't be dry. Um, I like that. But the reason the statutory cases might be interested from a constitutional point of view is that the court often interprets federal statutes in ways that are intended to avoid constitutional problems. So they will chisel back on an apparently uh, appealing interpretation of the statute in order to avoid having to reach the question of whether the broadly read statute is unconstitutional. And in deciding to steer clear in that way, sometimes the court gives us hints on where they think the boundaries of the constitutional doctrine are going to be. And they did that in their most recent uh, environmental Clean Water Act case in the 2001 case um, called uh, Solid Waste Agency of Northern Cook County versus Army Corps of Engineers, or as everybody calls it, the Swank case. Um, they ruled the Army Corps didn't have jurisdiction under the Clean Water Act to regulate isolated intrastate wetlands, and they did that on the basis of interpreting the definition of waters of the United States in the statute. But doing so explicitly because they thought if they gave it the kind of wall-to-wall -wall reading that waters of the United States might be susceptible to, it would raise a Commerce Clause problem. So one of the two Clean Water Act cases you might call this is the, uh, the son of Swank. <laughs> it involves a regulation of a wetland that lies adjacent to a drainage ditch that drains into another drainage ditch that then drains into a non-navigable creek and eventually drains into Lake St. Clair. So the question is, colloquially, is you know, how close do you have to be to the, to the navigable waters or the non-navigable tributaries of the navigable waters, both of those being categories of bodies of water the court has said there's clearly constitutional authority for the federal government to regulate. There's a small berm of land separating the wetland from this drainage ditch so that in normal conditions there's no surface water overflow from the wetland to the to the um, drainage ditch, but in times of, uh, of active rainfall or if there's a breach in this small berm, surface water does flow. And underwater, there's underground, there's seepage that's occurring quite regularly. So the case is going to, I, th I think, quite predictably will turn on, will be decided on a statutory ground, and it will involve the court figuring out what they think um, it, their, their prior standard, which is something like a jurisdiction extends to waters that are adjacent, to the wetlands that are adjacent to waters that the, that the federal government could regulate turns out to be. One side arguing a hydrological connection is enough, the other side arguing that it has to be a surface water connection um, as sufficient. So okay, I guess even Clean Water Act case can be pretty dry. But the, the point of the matter is that I think the court, in, at least in some of the opinions, and perhaps an opinion by Justice Alito or the Chief Justice will, again, hint at what they think the scope of the constitutional limits in the Commerce Clause area are, and thereby give us some clues as to whether 
the new conservative majority in the Commerce Clause area is prepared to be more restrictive than the, um, than the old Commerce Clause majority. So with those uh, introductory remarks and a couple of cases for you to, to watch uh, that are coming up, let me turn it over to my other two colleagues. It's a pleasure to be part of the panel. I very much agree with Chris's assessment in terms of the likely effects of both John Roberts and Samuel Alito. Now, Chris emphasized the short-term effect of Roberts replacing Rehnquist isn't likely to change outcomes in many cases. The only thing I would add to that is there is a long-term effect. John Roberts is 50 years old. If he stays on the court until he's 85, the current age of Justice John Paul Stevens, he'll be there until the year 2040, which is most of all of your careers as lawyers. And so the fact that this seat is going to continue to be held by a staunch conservative for decades to come, I think is worth noting. I also very much agree with Chris that I think that it is the shift from Justice O'Connor to a Justice Alito that does have the prospect of dramatically changing constitutional law in so many areas. There are so many recent Supreme Court cases that have been 5-4 decisions with Justice O'Connor in the majority. Chris mentions affirmative action. We could add to the list, as he also does, the abortion cases, separation of church-state, presidential power, death penalty, campaign finance, and so on. And that's why I think it's impossible to overstate the importance of this nomination for the Supreme Court. We're not here today to focus on the confirmation hearings. I think there may be the possibility of another panel later on. But I had the sense a couple of weeks ago that it was almost an Alice in Wonderland quality to the discussion of the effects of Samuel Alito on the Supreme Court. I think as to this nomination, both liberals and conservatives agree as to what Alito believes and what he's likely to do on the Supreme Court. That's why conservatives were literally gleeful when he was picked to replace instead of Harriet Myers, Senator Day O'Connor. And that's why liberals are so distressed. But as I watched the hearings, my sense was Republicans spent the week trying to pretend they really didn't know what Alito believed, and Democrats trying to spend the week trying to pin him down as to what he believed through his own answers to questions. Um, and whereas I think this really is one where everybody has the sense of what he's likely to be and how he's likely to move constitutional law substantially further to the right. And so I think if you're conservative, this is a nomination you should be joyous over. And if you're liberal, the idea that since he's 56, he too is likely to be there for decades to come, along with Clarence Thomas, who's 56, John Roberts, 50, and other conservatives around the court, but older, is very troubling. Um, let me talk about a few of the cases this term. Now, you probably already know this. Alito can only participate by Supreme Court tradition in cases where he's present is for oral argument, or at least a justice on the court. Now, there is exceptions to this tradition, but I think that the expectation is Alito will not participate in any decisions for cases that have been argued this year prior to his confirmation. And also by tradition, Sandra Day O'Connor will not participate in any decisions that come down after she's no longer on the court. So I think there's a consensus that the Supreme Court was rushing to get some cases out over the last couple of weeks where O'Connor had participated in oral argument because if she hadn't been there, well then, she wouldn't have been able to hand down the decision. And for example, it had been 5-4 with her presence and her in the majority, they would have put the case over for re-argument or affirmed the lower court by an evenly divided court. I don't think there's that many cases that are going to be argued in the court in February, March, and April that will give us a strong sense of what Alito is going to do as a justice. There are certainly some cases like this. Um, Chris mentioned the water pollution talk cases. One that I think is going to deservedly get a great deal of media attention is a case called Hamden versus Rumsfeld, which is scheduled to be argued on March 28th. Hamden is accused, I don't think there's much doubt that he was, of being a driver for bin Laden for a time. And he's held in Guantanamo. He's one of the first individuals to be designated to be tried in a military tribunal. His lawyers have brought a lawsuit challenging this. It's brought via writ of habeas corpus and other procedural devices. And the federal district court, in an opinion by Judge James Roberts on the federal district court in the District of Columbia, ruled in favor of Hamden. And Robertson's argument, simply put, was the Geneva Accords say that there has to be a competent tribunal 
to determine if somebody is a prisoner of war. If somebody is a prisoner of war, then they're entitled to a whole host of procedural protections, including those that would ordinarily be given to a soldier of that country in its own code of military justice. There's other things as well, including a requirement for repatriation at the end of the war. Robertson said that the procedures that have been created for military tribunals would not meet the requirements of the Geneva Accords, especially in the way they deviated from the American code of military justice for American soldiers. Robertson said, therefore, that Hamdan could not be tried in a military tribunal until it was first determined that he was not a prisoner of war, that the prior step to a military tribunal would have to be a competent tribunal to determine, in essence, that he's an enemy combatant rather than a prisoner of war. The United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit reversed Robertson here. Judge Randolph wrote an opinion for the court, and one of the other of the three judges on the panel was John Roberts. So Roberts has recused himself from participating in the case at the Supreme Court, quite appropriately so, because he shouldn't be reviewing his own decisions. Um, and the D.C. Circuit said that it did not violate separation of powers for the president to create the military tribunals, that it was authorized by statute, that the Geneva Accords were not violated by having the military tribunal for Hamden, and that indeed the, the Geneva Accords are not enforceable in American courts. The Supreme Court has granted review, and one interesting wrinkle to this is, subsequent to the D.C. Circuit decision, Congress has passed a statute, often referred to as the Graham-Kyle Levin statute, that keeps those in Guantanamo from being able to bring habeas corpus petitions into federal court. Instead, it says their way of review would ultimately be D.C. Circuit review of the decisions of a military tribunal. There is a dispute, even among the senators who voted for this, whether it applies only prospectively or it applies retroactively, including to Hamden, and so that's before the Supreme Court as well, though the Supreme Court refused to allow additional briefing on that issue. So assuming Alito is confirmed, he'll certainly be there for that. Um, going back to a case where Alito won't participate this term, but I think it's one of the more interesting cases on the docket, it's a case called Rumsfeld versus Forum for Academic and Institutional Rights. And I should disclose here that I am a named plaintiff in this lawsuit. If you go back and read the caption in the district court or the Court of Appeals, for that matter, it comes down in the Supreme Court, it will say Forum for Academic and Institutional Rights, comma, Erwin Chemerinsky, a resident of California, Sylvia Law, comma, a resident of New York, and then two law students. And how this came to be, that for the first time I'm actually a plaintiff in a lawsuit, is that many law schools adopted the policy of not allowing the military to use their career service offices. Law schools have long had a policy that they would not allow employers to use career service facilities if employers discriminate. Initially, it was written in terms of discrimination with regard to race or gender or religion, and then pursuant to an American Association of Law School policy, it also says that they will not allow employers to use school facilities if they discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation. As I'm sure you know, there's a federal statute that says that gays and lesbians are not allowed to serve in the military. Therefore, pursuant to their policy, they said that the military couldn't use career service facilities. Congress responded to this by adopting a law called the Solomon Amendment. Gerald Solomon, then a representative of Congress from New York, introduced a bill that was adopted that said and I'm oversimplifying, but basically the military must have the same access to campuses as all others. Military recruiters must be given the same access to campuses as all other recruiters. And there's a penalty for any school that violates it. As it came to be developed, the penalty is the university would lose all of its federal funding if it excluded the military from having such equal access. Now, most law schools don't get that much in federal money. But universities get a great deal in federal money, especially in medicine, engineering, the sciences. And so while a law school realistically could make the choice they would give up its federal money in order to be able to stay true as principal excluding the military, no university is going to make that choice. The Forum for Academic and Institutional Rights was organized for the purpose of bringing this lawsuit.
It does have law schools who are members as well as law professors and law students. And they decided that it would be good to have a couple of law professors as named plaintiffs and a couple of law students. Their argument is that it violated the First Amendment rights of law schools to force them to include military as recruiters if they didn't wish to do so. Federal District Court in New Jersey ruled against FAIR in favor of the Secretary of Defense. But in November of 2004, the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit reversed and ruled in favor of FAIR and the other plaintiffs. The Third Circuit said that this is compelled speech. Law schools are forced to express support for, at least implicitly so, those who are recruiting on campus. There's all sorts of ways in which law schools make announcements and the like, and that this forced speech violates the First Amendment rights of law schools. Also, the Third Circuit said, law schools have freedom of association. They should be able to decide who they want to associate with, especially when they have a clear, expressive message that's anti-discriminatory. The government sought and received cert. The case was argued on December 6th, and we'll see the decision in the next few months. Another case that's already been argued that I think is going to be very important, but Justice Alito, assuming he's confirmed, won't participate, is a case called House versus Bell that was argued in January. I think it's one of the most important death penalty cases to come to the Supreme Court in recent years. A man in Tennessee was convicted of murder. There were no eyewitnesses, there was no confession, so it was circumstantial evidence against him. At trial, the circumstantial evidence seemed strong. The prosecutor, in opening statement and closing argument, said that the motive for the murder was a rape. And indeed, semen was found on the victim's clothes, and the blood type of the semen matched the defendant's. And when it came time for the penalty phase of the case, the key aggravating factor that the prosecutor pointed to was the rape. Also, the victim's blood was found on the defendant's jeans. Some eyewitnesses saw the defendant coming from the area where the victim's body was found. The defendant was convicted and sentenced to death. Subsequently, the defendant brings a habeas corpus petition and wants to raise some issues that hadn't been raised before, most notably ineffective assistance of counsel. Well, one way in which you can raise things on habeas corpus that weren't raised before is to show that you're actually innocent of the crime. And that's what the defendant argued here, he was actually innocent. And he had some compelling arguments. Since the time of his conviction, DNA testing has come into existence, and a DNA test was done on the semen on the victim's clothes, and it does not match the defendant. In fact, the semen matches the defendant's, the victim's husband. So the defendant says the key aggravating factor they pointed to at the penalty phase, the motive for the crime was rape. Well, the evidence they used to show that does, it's not me. Also, it turns out that the victim had three vials of blood taken at the time of the autopsy. They were stored in the same drawer where the defendant's genes were stored. And it's undisputed that one of the vials of blood opened up in the drawer. Well, that would give a good explanation as to why the victim's blood were on the defendant's genes. Additionally, the defendant found a couple of witnesses who said that they heard the victim's husband say that he was responsible for the murder. And the question is, is this enough evidence of actual innocence? The United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit split by an eight to seven vote on that question. And they interestingly split by the political party of the president who appointed the judge. The eight judges on the Sixth Circuit who were appointed by Republican presidents said this was not enough evidence to show actual innocence. There was enough other evidence in the record to still allow the conviction to stand, to not be a basis for these new arguments to be presented. The seven judges on the Sixth Circuit who were appointed by Democratic presidents all said this was enough evidence of actual innocence. So what the Supreme Court has to decide here is, what is enough for somebody to show actual innocence? Now, the Supreme Court in recent years has and on a number of decisions in favor of capital defendants. And my take on that is at least some of the justices have been very moved by the work of the Innocence Project. And we need to see how it plays out. Since the case was argued in January, um, it looks like neither Justice O'Connor nor Justice Alito would participate. Finally, one more example, and then I'll turn it over to Neil. Um, there's some campaign finance cases this term that are quite important. And the reason I think this is significant 
in recent years, the Supreme Court has split five to four is to the ability of the government to regulate spending in election campaigns. The five in the majority have adhered to the principle that the government can limit contributions to candidates and committees for candidates, but the government can't limit overall expenditures. So if somebody had a million dollars to spend for Bush or for Kerry in 2004, the government could limit the amount that the individual would give directly to the candidate or to committee for the candidate. The contribution limit would be allowed. But the government couldn't spend, keep the person from spending the whole million dollars by dividing among many committees, taking out ads directly on TV and radio. But four justices, and especially of the current justices, Scalia, Kennedy, and Thomas, and I'm joined by Rehnquist, have been quite outspoken that they believe that any restriction on campaign contributions is unconstitutional. The contributions are a core form of political speech. In the most recent case, a case called McConnell versus Federal Election Commission, the Supreme Court upheld the McCain-Feingold Campaign Finance Reform Act, or at least the key provisions of it, but it was a 5-4 decision with O'Connor and Stevens writing a joint opinion joined by Souter, Ginsburg, and Breyer. With O'Connor gone, and especially with Alito places her, you have the possibility that the court could take the position that Scalia, Kennedy, and Thomas have long advocated that any limit on campaign contributions is unconstitutional. Now, one campaign finance case that was just argued about two weeks ago was decided day before yesterday, it's Wisconsin Right to Life Organization versus Federal Election Commission. And it was the question of even though the Supreme Court had upheld McCain-Feingold in general, could there still be an as-applied challenge, a challenge in the way it's applied to specific situations? And the Supreme Court unanimously said day before yesterday, yes, there can be as-applied challenges, even though the law was facially upheld. But it was a two-and-a-half-page ruling, that no further than that. Another campaign finance case that's about to be argued um, is a case called Randall versus Sorrell. It's a case coming out of Vermont, and it involves the state of Vermont imposing both contribution and expenditure limits with regard to state and local elections. And so this case will more directly put before the court whether it wants to continue the framework that it's been following so far. And so I think these are some of the more important cases of the term, along with what Chris talked about and what Neil's going to address. Are we here till 1.15 or 1.30? I think 115. Okay. All right. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm grateful to Professor Schrader for organizing these events because it puts a lot of meat on, on the idea of having a, a public law community here at, at Duke Law School. I don't want to repeat what's been said about the various comparisons uh, between justices who were on the court and justices who are now or will be on the court shortly. Uh, I don't take exception to anything that, that's been said. I think the, the comparisons have been accurate. The little I would add uh, has to do with uh, Roberts versus Chief Justice Rehnquist. Uh, Professor Schrader mentioned the Hibbs case dealing with whether Congress could authorize private citizens to sue states for violating the other care provisions of the Family Medical Leave Act. I agree that Chief Justice Roberts would have voted differently in that case. I would add that I have every reason to believe that Chief Justice Rehnquist would have voted differently <laughs> in that case had he been the fifth vote to affirm the Ninth Circuit as opposed to the sixth vote. That's quite a statement, and it's very cynical, but I think there's plenty of evidence, um, even publicly available evidence, that we can talk about to support that. If you look at the next case, Tennessee against Lane, Chief Justice Rehnquist writes his dissent as if the Hibbs case had never happened, right? So I think there's, there's good reason to believe that uh, once Justice O'Connor had cast a decisive vote, uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist became more flexible in the way he was going to come out. And in fact, he did control the majority opinion, and he wrote it He wrote it himself. So I think um, the one bit of evidence we have to suggest that Chief Justice Rehnquist and Chief Justice Roberts would be different, um, I think the story is a lot, more, a lot more complicated to that. I think his vote in that case was, was shocking uh, to people for whom, uh, who clerked for him. And I think the explanations um, sound in, in strategy more than, than, than jurisprudence. In terms of Justice O'Connor, versus Judge Alito. I think it's important, everyone talks about the importance of the O'Connor seat. I mean, the numbers are staggering, right? There's, there've been 193 5-4 decisions since 1995, and Justice O'Connor was in the majority in 148 of them. I mean, that's 77% of 5-4 decisions, her vote 
is decisive. No other justice comes close to that percentage. So there really is a lot at stake. Uh, a, f a number of those areas have been mentioned. Congress's power to enforce the 14th Amendment, affirmative action in higher education, restrictions on abortion, and whether they need to include health or life exceptions, government funding of religion, and symbolic endorsement of religion, campaign finance reform, ineffective assistance of counsel on death cases. Uh, last term for the third time in 20 years, the court invalidated the death sentence based on ineffective assistance, and Justice O'Connor was the fifth vote joining uh, uh, the more liberal members of the court. Uh, there, are, there are issues we could add, race conscious redistricting, exceptions to state action doctrine. If you learned the Brentwood case in first year con law dealing with entwinement, uh, the remedy for the court's previous decision that the federal sentencing guidelines are unconstitutional. Judge Alito may have a different view than Justice O'Connor, and that could change uh, the law of the land in very important ways. And these are just the five fours. Then there's plenty of areas in which replacing Justice O'Connor with Judge Alito could move the court one justice to the right in at least temporarily a non-decisive way, but nevertheless very important. If you think about the court's gay rights jurisprudence, if you think about issues of executive power, and also uh, Professor Schrader mentioned the Commerce Clause. I suspect rather strongly that Judge Alito is going to impose greater restrictions on Congress's power under the Commerce Clause and under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. I say that for two reasons. One is the only bit of evidence we have is his vote in the Rybar case dealing with personal possession of machine guns, and he went uh, way beyond anything the Rehnquist Court had ever done with respect to congressional power. Um, to say that you can't regulate personal possession of machine guns um, is, is, is something the court has plenty of opportunity to say because you get cert petitions, uh, requests for the court to hear the case all the time, raising challenges to federal criminal laws, and the court denies cert, right, declines to hear the case all the time, including in these machine gun type cases. So the only evidence we have suggests he has a broad view of, of, of state power, right, of limits on congressional power. But I think more generally than that, I think Justice O'Connor was very comfortable with not going too far by what she, and she had her own view of what it means to go too far, and she was willing to sacrifice principle or analytical purity for the sake of coming down somewhere in the middle, not pushing things to an extreme. The sense I get from Judge Alito is that he's more like Justice Scalia in terms of following out the log logical implications of a position. And the reason why the Commerce Clause jurisprudence is a bit of a mess is because the Constitution is a bit of a mess. Right? You've got two conflicting ideas. Right? The one is that you have a government of limited powers, of enumerated powers, that means something short of everything. And yet the powers that are listed, taken in combination, seem to give the federal government quite a lot of authority. Right? And it's very difficult. I don't think any justice in the history of the court has, um, who takes both sides of that conundrum seriously, has, has, has drawn an effective line. Justice O'Connor was of the view that we'll, we'll, we'll impose some limits but not go too far, and yeah, it's going to be messy, and I'm not, maybe not be able to justify it perfectly, but so be it. Right? I think Judge Alito is going to be more like Justice Scalia in terms of following out the implications of the position and the implications of cases like Lopez, Morrison, where the court has imposed strict limits on the Commerce Clause, um, suggests that he'll take the court further in that direction. One area that's not talked about where I think he'll be different than Justice Scalia is in free exercise, uh, free exercise of religion. Justice Scalia, his view is that as long as you have a neutral and generally applicable law, so be it if it has a uh, a strong disparate impact on the free exercise of religion, and it tends to be minority religions, right? Because majorities don't impose restrictions that interfere with their religious practice. Judge Alito seems to have a very strong view of free exercise, just like he has a very um, strong view of uh, in church state issues, right? He thinks that the Establishment Clause doesn't require the strict separation between church and state, like Justice Scalia. But in contrast, he also believes in robustly protecting minority religious rights. So it'll be very interesting to see how that plays out, right? When it comes to free exercise issues, it's not at all clear what it means to be a conservative. And I'm also interested to see what Judge Alito does once he's on the court with these basic interpretive debates, right? He hasn't, as a, a court of appeals judge, said, I'm an originalist or I'm a textualist. And there's often not a lot of occasion to do that as a court of appeals judge, because you're whatever you are, you're supposed to be following what the what the Supreme Court says. But that doesn't 
hasn't kept other jurists like, for example, Richard Posner from having his own view, his own theory of constitutional interpretation. Judge Alito hasn't really come out very strongly publicly in favor of one way or the other, and it'll be interesting to see if that changes, uh, that changes in, in the years to come. In terms of cases on the, uh, the docket this term, some important ones have just come down, and I want to mention them very briefly because I would like to leave, I would like to leave time for questions. Uh, the first, the Ayotte case, Ayotte against Planned Parenthood of Northern New England, this was supposed to be, um, and in, to some extent still is, a very important abortion, abortion case on the court's docket. It was uh, thought that it the court would be deciding whether or not there needs to be a health exception um, in general when there are restrictions on abortion, and particularly with respect to parental notification statutes, as well as uh, a technical but very important question about the standard of review when challenging abortion restrictions. Right? Does the person challenging the statute have to show that there are no set of circumstances in which it could be constitutionally applied when you're challenging the statute on its face before it even goes into effect? Or do you have to rather do what the court has said you do in abortion cases, which is the undue burden test? show a, a number of instances, but not no set of circumstances in which there would be constitutional problems. To many people's surprise, the court decided this case unanimously. Okay, 9-0 was Justice O'Connor's last written opinion as a justice, and it was, I think in many ways, quintessentially Justice O'Connor's way. When the court decides an abortion case 9-0, right, it probably means that they didn't decide nearly as much as people thought that they were going to, and the first sentence of her opinion is telling. We do not revisit our abortion precedents today, but rather address the question of remedy. If a forcing a statute that regulates access to abortion would be unconstitutional in medical emergencies, what's the appropriate response? And in the holding, we hold that invalidating the statute entirely is not always necessary or justified, for lower courts may be able to render narrow declaratory and injunctive relief. So what she said in this case, this dealt with a New Hampshire statute that required minors to get parental, uh, required a doctor to, to inform the parents of a minor uh, before the doctor performed an abortion and wait at least 48 hours until uh, after written notice of the abortion had been delivered to the parent or the guardian. And there were some complications. It was a judicial bypass procedure, the adequacy of which was challenged. But the issue here in the case was, what do you do in situations in which Requ uh, requiring the notice or giving the notice might actually impair the health of the minor. Okay, there was no provision in the statute that said you don't have to give notice to the parents when there is a medical a medical emergency. And is that statute constitutional? And what the court basically said is both sides in this case have a good point. On the one hand, New Hampshire and the U.S. government, which supported New Hampshire, they have a good point by saying, look, the overwhelming majority of applications of this law are unproblematic. Right? Most, almost always, you're not going to have a health emergency that's going to impede giving the parents notice. But they said, on the other hand, the people challenging this law also have a good point, which is it makes no sense to say that you can't challenge the constitutionality of this law until one person actually has the medical emergency. In other words, when it's too late. Right? If you can't challenge it on its face before it goes into effect, and you can only challenge it as applied when your case comes up, right? well, then it's going to be too late. And so what the court said was the lower court went too far in striking down the statute facially, right? because the overwhelming majority of applications are unproblematic. What the court should do is think about whether or not it would be consistent with the legislative intent when New Hampshire wrote this law to allow an exception in cases of medical emergencies to issue a narrower injunction saying that this statute can't be constitutionally applied in medical emergencies. Now, the court left a lot undecided. I like to say that it's good to be the king, right? Because when you're the court, you can decide what you're going to decide. And the court didn't say, well, what do I mean by a medical emergency? Are we talking about a health exception generally or an emergency health exception? What qualifies as a medical emergency? The court didn't say what the mens rea of the doctor has to be. If the doctor has a good faith belief that this is a medical emergency and it's objectively unreasonable, right, does that fall within the exception? Or does there have to be an objective reasonableness requirement imposed? You can bet Justices Scalia and Ginsburg are going to have somewhat different views about exactly what the scope of this emergency health exception 
is going to be. That was all given back to the lower court um, in reconsidering the case. And it was also given uh, to the lower court to decide whether or not it was consistent with the legislative intent to actually allow this kind of an emergency exception. So the court here is um, sort of temporarily came together uh, in, in an important abortion case, but also left a lot of important questions undecided that the court will take on in the future. Uh, the other case I wanted to talk about, which recently came down and has gotten a lot of press, is the Gonzalez against Oregon case. Right? This was the physician-assisted suicide case that's gotten a lot of attention in the media. It's important to understand what the court decided and what the court didn't decide in this case. Okay, back in 1997, in the Washington against Glucksburg case, the court unanimously declined to declare that the Constitution protects a right, an individual constitutional right, to physician-assisted suicide. There was a lot of sentiment within the court uh, across the ideological spectrum that this is a sort of issue that the states ought to be dealing with, that we, the court, are not going to federalize the issue and declare a right. What happened since then is when you had the, tran uh, the, tran uh, the transition from the Clinton administration to the Bush administration, the view of the attorney general on these state experiments changed. So Janet Reno, when she was the attorney general, said, I'm not going to interpret my power under federal drug law to invalidate these, state, these experiments on the state level. Oregon had, is the only state in the country that has a physician-assisted a physician assisted suicide law. And Janet Rito had been asked to put an end to that experiment by declaring that federal drug law and her power under federal drug law says that states can't do this kind of thing. She declined to exercise that authority. She didn't think Congress had given it to her. When the Bush administration took over, Attorney General Ashcroft issued an interpretive rule changing the position of the federal government. And in the federal drug laws, which regulate federally controlled substances, the kind of drugs that are prescribed when a physician is assisting in a suicide, Attorney General Ashcroft said that in order for physicians to prescribe these drugs, it has to be for a legitimate medical purpose. Right, that's what, there's some language in federal drug law, there's some language in regulations that shortly accompanied federal drug law. This is all back in 1970, 1971. And what he said was, insisting a suicide is in no sense a legitimate medical purpose. Therefore, any doctor in Oregon that prescribes federally controlled substances in order to assist in a suicide is not doing so for a legitimate medical purpose and will have his prescribing authority revoked. Right? And it's very hard to function as a physician if you can't prescribe federally controlled substances. The question in the case was whether or not the Attorney General had permissibly exercised his authority under federal drug law. And what the court held six to three was that he had gone too far, that he had overreached, that Congress, in passing federal drug laws, the Controlled Substances Act, back in 1970, had uh, in no sense was attempt attempting implicitly to put an end to the profound moral and political debate in the country over the ethics, the morality of physician-assisted suicide, right? That whether or not physician-assisted suicide is a legitimate medical purpose, reasonable people can disagree, but there's no evidence in the text, structure, history of federal drug law that in fact Congress was trying to decide this issue. So the court didn't decide whether there is a constitutional right to physician-assisted suicide. The court didn't even decide whether Congress could constitutionally be authorized to regulate physician-assisted suicide. All the court held was, under the law that Congress has passed, it, it, it did not evince an intent, uh, a purpose, to regulate this issue. Right? If Congress came back going forward and tried to, that would be a different situation, although there hasn't been the political will for this. Right? When John Ashcroft was a senator, he had tried to get the federal government to pass a law not allowing physician-assisted suicide, and they failed in the Congress. Um, so it's a limited holding, but nevertheless an important one. Right? If this case comes out the other way, then Oregon's experiment is put to an end under, under uh, supremacy clause preemption principles. Right? Valid federal law trumps state law that conflicts with it. An important, more general lesson about this is it goes beyond physician-assisted suicide, right? When you think about abortion, we often hear the conventional wisdom that if the court overrules, overrules Roe and overrules Casey, which, which reaffirmed the core of Roe, the matter is going to be left to the states, right? This is not an issue in which you're going to have abortion being illegal. And what I would say is that's certainly one possibility, but that's not the ineluctable possibility, 
right? Because what you have in this situation is the court declining to declare a federal constitutional right to physician assisted suicide, and then actions within the federal government attempting to federalize the issue in the opposite direction, taking it off the table. And I don't think, especially after, if you think about the Terry Schiavo case, if you think about the Federal Partial Birth Abortion Act, which tried to federalize that issue, I don't think it's beyond the pale to think that soon after the court overruled Roe, there would be some movement or attempts in Congress, especially if it's a conservatively controlled Congress, to try and federalize the abortion issue in the other direction. Right? So it's not at all clear that, 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 that abortion would be left to the states. Um, this, I think, I think this assisted suicide case suggests that, that um, you know, there could be various scenarios um, the way in which the issue, the issue could play out. Let me just stop there take um, and take some questions. Uh, um, one of the kind of the hallmarks of the Rehnquist Court has been kind of this commitment to federalism and states' rights and limiting Congress's power. I think Professor Chimmerman you to talk last year about how federalism uh, is more of a tool that can be used by whatever parties out of power at the federal level to try to implement their policy at the states. And so do you think that um, either Roberts and Alito changing, do you think that they'll kind of jettison that commitment if you have a prolonged conservative majority in the federal level, or will they kind of stick to it even though the federal government might be more conservative than the states? I think an interesting aspect of the Rehnquist Court's federalism is that they were limiting the scope of Congress's power under the Commerce Clause, under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, often especially doing so to strike down or narrow the reach of civil rights laws. Um, the Violence Against Women Act, the Age Discrimination Employment Act, Title I of the Americans with Disabilities Act, all being this. And the interesting thing is, though, that you might think that a court committed to states' rights would want to narrow the scope of federal preemption, because one way to empower the states is having less preemption. But the Rehnquist Court didn't do this. In a whole series of decisions, the Rehnquist Court broadly found preemption of state laws especially when it was businesses challenging state regulation of business. And so when there was a question of whether or not a federal statute preempted state products liability law, even though the federal statute said it didn't have any preemptive effect of state laws, the court nonetheless found preemption. And we can go in with other examples of that as well. So I think that's the context in, of what you were asking me. Now, to put on my crystal ball, there's a way in which, of course, the Bush administration has tremendously increased federal power, and that's in connection with the war on terrorism. And there are dimensions of that that have federalism consequences. So for instance, when the federal government is forcing states to house some federal detainees, and this is a case from New Jersey, and New Jersey had a law that said that anybody who's held in New Jersey is a matter of public record, um, the federal government adopted regulations to preempt the New Jersey law, and ultimately it was preempted. So my own sense is that this is a court likely to defer to broad presidential power that's going to have some indirect implications with regard to federalism. But I think that the Rehnquist Alito court, together with Scalia, Kennedy, Thomas, who are already there, are likely to pursue further limits on the commerce power, Section 5, and expansions of sovereign immunity. I would just say briefly, I think it's overly cynical to to, to think of constitutional law as political all the way down. And so conservatives like federal power if they're conservatives in Congress using it in ways they like and then otherwise they don't like federal power. There's always some truth to that, but there's also important truths on the other side. So for example, Justices Scalia and Thomas are on opposite sides in the medical marijuana case, right? the Rage case from last term. I think one interesting issue that that kind of case highlights is the differences among conservatives, right? Sort of the substance social conservatives versus the process federalist conservatives, right? Do you care how the issue is resolved or do you care more about who resolves the issue? And I think conservatives, sort of like liberals, um, come down differently depending upon what their primary commitment is. Please. Um, what do you think the chances are of Bush taking a third justice? Mm -hmm. You think uh, Stevens is going to make it for that long? Or? <laughs> at, at his confirmation hearings, he had recently had uh, heart surgery, and he said, "Don't worry about me. I'm built for longevity. My mom lived till I was, she was 94. My dad lived until he was 88. He's 85 and a half, and I can report that he's in wonderful health, and his mind is as sharp as ever. 
So there's no in, he's hired clerks two years out, so there's no indication that he's having any problem now. I don't know, but I'm told that when you get to be that age, and this is the big but, right, you can be doing fine and then go to bed one night and then things aren't looking so good in the morning. So I don't, you know, I think when you're, when you're that old, it's hard to know, but there's no indication now he has any intent of going anywhere. Please. How would, yeah, do, do you suspect that something like the Reich case would be revisited um, um, if Congress or the Supreme Court did uh, narrow the reach of the Interstate Commerce Clause? My only thing is, I don't think Raish is important enough by itself that that issue is likely to come up. I think there are going to be other things that are regarded as much more important where the court will revisit them. I'll go to Chris's example. I think affirmative action in the Grutter versus Bollinger case will be revisited as soon as the court gets the vehicle for doing so. I think the partial birth abortion issue is likely to be visited, and there's a vehicle for doing so in terms of a recent Court of Appeals case. But I think whether Congress has the ability to prohibit medical use of marijuana, I think is interesting, but I don't think it has the kind of social consequences that would mean that there has to be reconsideration. And there's certainly plenty of precedent for rapid reconsideration of issues when there's a change in the composition of the court. My example of this would be some cases involving victim impact statements. In the late 1980s, the Supreme Court, in a couple of cases, Booth and Gathers specifically ruled that you could not have a statement before a jury about the impact of the victim's death on the rest of the victim's family and acquaintances and the like. As soon as there was a change in the composition of the court, um, and they were able to get the votes, I mean, just literally two years later, in a case called Payne versus Tennessee, the Supreme Court overruled Booth and Gathers. So there's plenty of precedent for a quick change in law based on a shift in the composition of the court. Yeah. With respect to your question specifically, the votes aren't there. Raich was 6-3 with Scalia and Kennedy in the majority, and my sense from the oral argument transcript in the Gonzalez case, when Chief Justice Roberts referred back to Raich, I think if he had been there, it would have been 7-2. Right, that he would have, if anything, he would have been more on the side of federal power than, than Chief Justice Rehnquist. The reason I'm asking about Raish in particular is because it's not a terribly important issue, like you suggested. And I know the previous Commerce Clause cases um, uh, dealing with the Gun Free School Zones Act or the Violence Against Women Act were not terribly important pieces of legislation since there are already many state, a lot of state legislation dealing with those issues. So I'm wondering if they did revisit interstate commerce, would it likely be on another? issue where the actual piece of legislation itself is not very important. It's an excellent question. How much of, how much of, the, of these decisions is about symbolism and how much of this is about substance? You know, the Gun-Free School Zones Act, I think the, the Violence Against Women Act um, is more, much more controversial. It suggests it's unimportant. But the Gun-Free School Zones Act, when the overwhelming majority of states don't like kids having guns in school zones, right? I, I think it's hard to say that that was an important piece of federal legislation. Um, it, 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 it's unclear how much, you know, the court has, has, has scrupulously avoided uh, anything that would suggest Title VII is, is vulnerable, because then America might start paying attention to these federalism decisions. And for the most part, they, they don't. Most people don't know what state sovereign immunity is. I'll give one more example where I predict you're going to see a very quick shift by the court, maybe the fastest of all the years, and that's separation of church-state. This is such an important social issue. And there have been four votes as recently as June 27th of 2005 to dramatically change the law with regard to the Establishment Clause. And I think there's every reason to believe that Roberts and Alito will join with Scalia, Kennedy, and Thomas there. And the practical effect will be much more ability of government to have religious symbols on government property, much more ability of the government to give aid to parochial schools and the like. But this has so long been a target of conservatives, and I think they'll finally have the five votes. And I, I don't think you're going to see it this term, but I think you'll see it next term that they can get the vehicle for doing it. And I don't think it's a coincidence that you saw the Democrats mentioning this almost not at all during the last two confirmation hearings, because I think they regard it as a loser issue for them politically in the eyes of, of most Americans in terms of the polling. I think we're out of time. Yeah. Thank you. We can stay and take questions informally. Yeah. Yeah.